Serious note, Friday night at the Martinsburg uh, football game outside of the stadium at uh, the intersection of Barry and Raleigh, there was a shooting incident about three uh, minutes before 7 o'clock. Martinsburg Police Department uh, officers responded to shots fired in the area. I'm, I'm guessing most of our audience have heard the story by now. Uh, we will have uh, Chief Aaron Gibbons on the program tomorrow. I asked him to come on today. Uh, he said they needed an extra day to gather more information and would have a better uh, complete report by tomorrow morning. So the Chief Gibbons uh, will be on our program tomorrow to talk about that incident Friday night in which uh, three spectators inside the stadium were hit. Uh, two by uh, what is believed to be shrapnel. Uh, another uh, was struck uh, from one of the shots. Uh, they were all non-life-threatening injuries, as we understand it from the report from the MPD. Uh, via telephone, that uh, noise in the background belongs to Phil McCoy. Phil, what are you doing back there? I'm doing nothing. I'm just, I just pulled into the driveway at work, so shouldn't have been my noise. Don't put that evil on me. Somebody, somebody was fussing with something. That's all right. I don't know. It stopped as soon as I mentioned it. it. As soon as I mentioned it, stopped. At least anyway. Phil, good morning to you, buddy. How about those Steelers? How are you? How about those Steelers? What what a first week in the NFL was. I was just telling Dylan, who's still licking his wounds from the Ravens losing, but from a Steelers standpoint, the Steelers win in Steeler fashion with a million field goals. The Bengals lost. The Browns lost. The Ravens lost. And from a personal standpoint. The Washington football team, or whatever they call themselves now, they lost. It was a good first week in the NFL in the McCoy household. That's the way, Dylan, that's the way I look at it. As we, we go into week two, assured of nothing worse than a tie for first place in the, NF, in the NFC, uh, NFL North there, I should say. Uh, Sitting yeah. atop. You couldn't be better than 1-0 and right now. Can't do it. <laughs> Can't top 1-0. It, it would have it would have helped, uh, I think, the Falcons if they had a quarterback who could move. It seemed like that was uh, – not something that, that, that they had in their bag of you, tricks. You, Dylan, you can't move when T.J. Watt is on your back. That was, <laughs> that's, that's why true. he couldn't move. Watt yeah. had a monster game. They they took one sack strip away from him because they called him offside, and they later apologized to him after the game that they were wrong over calling him offside, and another one was negated by a penalty. He was a, just a wrecker yesterday, yeah. as, as usual. Yes, he was. Yeah, I feel like the only thing yes, that gets in the way of uh, T.J. Watt, Defensive Player of the Year, is him not playing enough games, basically. I don't know. He, he played most of them last year. The Pro Football Focus, which is owned by Chris Collinsworth, values beating the guy in front of you more than it values sacks. It's an odd formula for how they value things in the NFL. In other words, they value appearance more so than playmaking, which is just – berserk the, the, their whole thing is essentially assigning graders to every game and they watch and they give like a film grade so it's still subjective even though it's it's kind of put across as slightly more objective because I, they put numbered grades on it so. I, I would i would agree yeah uh dylan the incident friday night uh, at, at the martinsburg game uh, were you at the stadium friday night yeah we were in the press box i personally didn't hear anything myself with i guess with headphones and being inside the press box our cameraman kenny may up on the up on the top said that he was able to to hear it i don't know if he really realized what it was at the time but it was during the national anthem apparently were you aware that people had been struck in the stadium uh by about the third quarter we uh, we started hearing a couple things maybe that even the uh, early in the first half we started to hear some things but not enough for us to you know, really go on the air and say any much of, about it because we, was, we didn't, you know, didn't want to risk putting out information that, that mm -hmm. wasn't accurate. But we heard from about the third quarter that was the case. Was there any reaction inside the stadium during the anthem that made it apparent that something had happened or was going on? Not that I had noticed. I mean, maybe maybe there was, but just from up in the press box during, during the anthem, I, nothing that I personally noticed. Interesting. Okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. And otherwise, Martinsburg steamrolled another team. And in other words, when it's sunny, it's warm. <laughs> <laughs> the, the news that is obvious. Uh, quad A this year is, uh, I, I think, the, the coach of uh, Wheeling Central Catholic is, is another one. I think their program, like Martinsburg's, I, I think singled out for these this expansion to Quad A to try to negate the winning of one particular school all the time and 
What they've done now with Quad A is they've weakened it to the point where there's just 16 teams left. Everybody makes the playoffs. And the SSAC is the only real group that benefits from this because they make their money in playoff games. They keep the vast majority of the gate receipts from playoff games. So they'll just have more playoff games that they get to keep money for. And otherwise, I can't think of a legitimate reason for a Quad A in West Virginia in a state with declining enrollment, you are, you're expanding classifications. There's less high schools and more classes. Now, it makes zero sense to me, Dylan. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. I, I, it's a lot of things it just comes across as a money grab. I mean, even in the pro sports league, the way that they expand the playoffs, add games like the NFL does, up to 17 games, seven teams in the playoffs, it's all to have more games that you can offer up to to the streaming platforms for more money. And you know, At this case, it could just you know be – ticket sales from from games adding them on so i'm with you phil back to you it looks like uh after a pretty horrible week last week it's a decent start to monday morning stock futures why did last week suck so bad for stocks uh well as always it was a bit of an overreaction but we had a huge focus on employment numbers last week but, you know, looking back on it, that's almost – and I didn't really feel this way last week, but, but over the weekend and today I, I do. With employment numbers, it's almost a game that you can't win right now. If they're too good, then from, from the standpoint of our battle with inflation, if employment numbers are too good, then we're going to say, oh, no, that's an inflationary pressure. And, and we start talking about whether or not the Federal Reserve, how many cuts. I think it's pretty much assumed – that there's going to be a cut in a in a week or so from the Federal Reserve. But if the employment numbers were too good, then we'd start rumbling about how many cuts in, in 2024. But if they fall back a little bit, and in some cases they did, the overall unemployment number came down some. But, uh, but when you dig into it, it was, I guess it was on the negative side of employment numbers. So then we start talking about recession. We are really walking a tightrope right now between – the battle of inflation, wanting to see inflation come down. But on the flip side of that, some of these things that make inflation come down are triggers for recession. So that there, there's those recession fears now that we have. I'm hopeful this week with the CPI numbers and and the alphabet soup is, is Mr. Stubblefield had named it so, so long ago, but the alphabet soup of inflation reports start to come out this week and that's where I think we could have some upside. You know, if we still see continued falling toward that 2% inflation target, I think that would be a positive for our markets, of course. Uh, but but on the job front last week, I really do think it was like playing a game that you, that you just couldn't win. This morning, the market looks like this. The Dow futures are up six-tenths. S&P futures up six-tenths. NASDAQ futures are up uh, seven tenths, and uh, the S and P 500 had its worst week since 2023 last week, as uh, Phil was uh, referring to that too. Uh, back to this week, Phil, and uh, reports and information that's coming out this week. Can you address that again? Yeah, it's the CPI report, or the Consumer Price Index, and although it's not the one that the Federal Reserve uh, says that they point to and, and use as a gauge for inflation. It is typically the first report that comes out, so therefore it gets the most attention, and the perception is that it moves the markets. Uh, and, and so what we're expecting, and this is a huge number, what we're expecting to see is 2.6, and I think that's down from 2.9 on a overall basis. But if you strip out the price of inter- or the, the cost of energy and food, they're expecting 3.2. So it's not so much – what happens with the number it is what happens in relationship to what we expect to happen and that's what we expect is to see a 2.6 percent overall cpi number and that would be a, a pretty significant fall from where where it has been if we rewind uh maybe 15 16 months ago where it had peaked out up there around nine percent now we're d- down to 2.6 i know what john gilstrap's thinking he says that doesn't mean and that is a reminder to consumers. That doesn't mean prices are coming down. That means prices are going up slower than what they were before. But what the, the, the target is, and they've, they've stayed on this number, the target that they, the Federal Reserve wants to see is 2%. We got CPI and PPI this week, correct? 
Yes, uh, so CPI will come out day one, and the next day will be PPI, and that normally gets overshadowed because we're still talking about the first inflation. Sounds like you need a urologist. <laughs> it's <a> PPI. <laughs> Consumer price index, producer's price index. Which is more important, Phil? Uh, the consumer price index, because it's the first one. I don't know that either one of them would have uh, gives us any better indication of what's going on with inflation. But the CPI, the consumer price index, is what we care about. We care about consumers, and it's typically, not always. I'm yet to figure that out. I'd be lying if I said I, I know why, but occasionally the PPI will come first. But the CPI comes first this week, which is the consumer price index, followed by the producer price index. And then the, the University of Michigan Consumer Survey comes out this week, too. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, it's a sentiment. And what they're trying to read is how does consumers feel about the economy? And typically, in, and I don't know what it would mean right now, but typically during normal circumstances where we're not in a full-fisted battle with, uh, with inflation, we want to see confident consumers because confident consumers – Spend money. I think right now we kind of want to see a whole hum consumer confidence report, and 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 I don't I don't know how much I really put in, into that, but because they're getting a, it's almost like a poll, you know, like a political poll where you can you can read it any way that you want, but the consumer uh, the consumer confidence is what we're looking for with that, and the more con- a more confident consumer spends more money, but a consumer that spends more money. Also, is an inflationary pressure, which we're battling right now. Is the cons- a consumer's attitude seems to me like it would be very fluid from week to week. So, for instance, it's very fickle. People, very fickle. If, if the market's doing well, many people feel better about spending money because you can see yes, that your investments are worth more money, your four hundred one k is worth more money, or whatever. If oil prices drop and the price of the pump goes down, people feel better about how less. How much, how much less money they have to spend putting gasoline in their car. So I imagine that these things are very much dependent on, well, how was the market the day I was surveyed? How, how were gas prices the day I was surveyed? Do you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. And, that, and I think this is fascinating, but there's a, a uh, consumer behavior or finance behavior. Um, it's, it's known in that world that even though, let's take a 35-year-old, you may be 30, 40 years away from touching your 401k but if you open up your balance if you're looking at it daily weekly monthly whatever it may be and it looks better it's going up quickly that and that causes people in present day which makes no sense but it causes people in present day in today's day more confident more willing to go out and spend money even though you're looking at a number that you're 30 years away from from uh, being able to or or should be able to access in your 401k. But when we look at that type of when our savings are going up, even though we're not using our savings in the interim, it does it does uh, incite people to spend money. And uh, which, again, you know, in, in this world that we live in, while we're still battling inflation, and I agree with John Gilstrap, why don't they just say stop at 2.5? But if we're still battling inflation, and a, a, a consumer willing to spend money is an inflationary pressure, and that could be a bad thing. We still could be holding on to some of this good news is bad news, bad news is good news. There's still a few of these reports out there that would uh, indicate that we, we still want to see a little bit of bad news. Consumer confidence may be one of them. I don't think it needs to be terrible, but uh, we don't want to see uh, we don't want to see consumers too happy right now. I'm curious, what percentage of your clients do the smart thing, and on the day that a market tanks, they give you a bunch more money to invest? Because uh, those those that have cash, and that's a great question. We have a handful that may be you know individual business owners that are more likely to have cash on hand, or they've been saving for something. But a great deal of them, you know, we have some that uh, say, well, I may be uh, purchasing, or I may be doing some work around my house, and and you know that your example leads me back to think during uh, just shortly post COVID, where people did save a lot of money, they did hang on to a lot of money out of fear. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know, you know, this, the money that the government's pumping into us and that we've saved because we couldn't do things. So people were hoarding money, if you will, and I can't say that I, I blame them, but they had intended on 
doing some sort of project, and we all remember the price of lumber. If you remember that, the price of lumber just shot through the roof, which stopped a lot of those projects. That those clients did, they would, or we we typically know about the cash, quite honestly, and we say, hey, now's a good time to throw this in. We're not into timing the market, but we also can't be blind. If we had a 20% drop, well, it's 20% cheaper now than what it was before. That's not necessarily timing, but if you're sitting on the cash anyway, that happens quite a bit. But it's normally with our prompting, telling telling these people like, hey, now's a good time, unless you know that you're going to uh, remodel your house or something's changed on that front. Unless you're getting ready to do that, now's a good time. But it does happen quite often. It was hard to spend money during COVID because nothing was open. <laughs> it was easy to say, right? Right. John, uh, Phil, going back to your um, uh, to your your clients, the attitudes. Uh, someone become very paranoid looking at the market. Last week, the worst uh, we've had all year. This coming week, uh, it's already got a boost about 250 points, so it's supposed to be much, much better. The schizophrenia of the market uh, would drive someone to lunacy, I think. Uh, how many of your clients actually look at trends or caught up in the daily maneuverability or maneuvering of the, of the market? Very few. The, the, most of most of our clients will look at their uh, their accounts once a week. Some just look at it when their statements come. By and large, uh, the the bigger issue that I think not just us but a lot of people face is they they get uh, paranoid about uh, elections. You know, you become fearful of who's going to become president, or you become fearful of who's going to control the house, or you don't like some policies. So that's the, that's the number one behavior that we try to to moderate is to say, look, it really it, it really I don't want to say it doesn't matter because it's kind of flipping, but it but it, it does matter. But in terms of what's going to happen to the overall markets in the long run, it's shown that it, it doesn't really matter that much, and there's no reason to panic. But from you know a technical basis on a daily or a weekly trend. We have very few that notice that unless they're scheduled to come in for an appointment. We do have it is common behavior where someone doesn't look at their accounts. We have one. He only looks when he comes in and he cracks me up because he says he, he used to have a whole a garage full of statements. And we said, you could turn this stuff online. You don't need to keep your, your boxes and garage of statements. He didn't know that. So we set him up online, but he only looks when he comes in, and I would say there's probably 10, whether it's good or bad, that I ask. Now, we need to tell people how things are going if there's any changes, but I'll ask, do you want to see the number? And of those 10 clients that I need to make sure, about 50% of the time they said, no, I don't want to see it, good or bad. They don't want to see it, because they, and it's wise, because they don't want emotion to impact what type of decisions that they make. They want to remove emotion, so therefore they don't want to see the number. But uh, but overall, on a, on, a, on a weekly basis, daily basis, very few, if any, Bill, that, uh, that, that we hear from, very few. The, uh, if you look at things on a global basis, uh, the U.S. Excuse me, sorry. The U.S. has done quite has been very successful in curbing inflation compared to the rest of the world. Yes, we have. But yet, yes, we have. very little credit is given to that. Uh, why is that? I, I, I think I blame it on Rob Mario. For his <laughs> <decision>. <laughs> why not? To begin with. But, uh, but it, because it still hurts. And, and I think that's the main reason. And again, that's a number, another in, uh, behavior of consumers or investors. It does still hurt, even though it's not as bad as someone else's hurt or someone across the world. We're not really empathetic to, to their, their inflation woes. We're more concerned about our own. But it does still hurt, and I analogize a lot of things. But if I break my finger and I've broken them all back in my shepherd days and it really, really hurts, I'm not very sympathetic to someone who broke their arm, even though their arm is hurting worse than mine. I'm more concerned about my broken finger, and the United States has a broken finger in comparison to the rest of the world right now. We have done uh, when you compare it to everyone else, we have done a good job with inflation, but it doesn't mean it, it still doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. You know, I encountered something uh, last week. I was traveling, went to the Gaylord Opryland Hotel in Nashville, or actually outside of Nashville. Never encountered I was in Tennessee as well. Were, were you all visiting the home? Yes, I was. I was in Pigeon Forager, Severe Bill. I can't pronounce it correctly. <laughs> I was there Severe too. Bill. 
when I went into Tennessee, it said the home of Bill Stubblefield. And I thought I know that <laughs> That's right, yeah. So, In neon lights, yes. At the hotel, they would not take cash. It's a cashless hotel. Ah, and yes, I don't I don't the, understand. The enemy of Dave I, Ramsey. You know, I, I have done uh, so, quite a bit of traveling due to my daughter volleyball, and I saw that in Hawaii, and I saw that in Tennessee. I haven't seen it in West Virginia, but I saw that in two places, and, and I haven't really wrapped my head around why that is, but in Tennessee in particular, I did notice that, that it was either credit card or they, they suggested you use your phone other than uh, beside the credit card. And I think that's why we can go back. I keep blaming everything on COVID, but I think we can go back to COVID for that because cash started to disappear a little bit during COVID. We didn't want to touch each other. We didn't want to use that dirty money. And retailers saw that, heck, most people are using card or some sort of payment app anyway. So why don't we just remove cash altogether? We don't have to worry about the risk of losing the cash. It's easier with your books. It's only one for one method of accounting. So I did notice that in abundance in Tennessee. I even saw it a few places in rural Hawaii as well. Not many, but I did see it a few places in Hawaii as well. It was. I thought it was interesting myself. It just occurred to me because we've talked on this show a lot about how many people are in credit card debt and how crippling that credit card debt is and how it seemed to be perpetuating it. And I also thought about Dave Ramsey, whose head must explode when uh, it's just, by the way, the Bellman, they're perfectly happy with cash. That, right. that, was, that was not a yeah, problem. Yeah. You don't have I to report Dave cash. Ramsey interesting. Yeah. I like Dave Ramsey as well. I think he gives a lot of good world advice, but I found it a little hypocritical because he, a credit card can be a good tool. If you pay it off, it's like a hammer. A hammer is a good tool unless you're working on glass. So, but a credit card can be a good tool for budgeting. Um, you, you get a little bit of points. You're not going to win the point battle, as he would point out. But I found it hypocritical when he was chastising one of his – he's mean to some of his callers. One of his callers were talking about credit cards. And then the very next uh, commercial was about a Dave Ramsey cruise. It was a financial education cruise. And call it a day. We accept. Visa, American Express, and MasterCard. <laughs> it was the very, the very next ad. I was like, well, which one is it, Dave? Well, you should just tell us to send in a check or cash. But uh, credit cards can be an issue if you're, if you're not disciplined enough to pay those suckers off. Don't pay any of the fees at the end of each month. I mean, I know people get in those situations where they have no other choice. That's where they get dangerous is you're spending money you don't have when you put it on the credit card and you can't pay it when that bill comes due. But if you can pay it, and if you know what's on there, and you know um, exactly what's going to that, number one, just like a retailer or a consumer, can reduce their risk of loss too, because money, as we all know, can burn a hole in your pocket. Well, and those 30% interest rates, my goodness, you, it's tough to pay off a credit card when you're paying 30% interest on something like that. Phil, I got about yes, 30 seconds left. How do we get in touch with you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. And by the way, Jeff Haddix said, uh, stop asking Phil the same damn questions every week. Ask him about annuities. So, Phil, next time that you're on, we're going to take up a Jeff question about annuities. I'm not a big fan of annuities because they're front-loaded with so much commission uh, on the front end, but uh, some people Let's like do that. Let's do that next Let's time. Let's talk about non-qualified. Let's talk about non-qualified annuities next week. Jeff, tune in. We'll talk about non-qualified annuities, and I'll get fired up. So hey, you can talk with Phil each morning at 638. He gives us two minutes of uh, preview of the day's market and wraps up what happened the day before, too. That's each morning, two minutes at 638. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg. Mm -hmm.